All right, we're going to get started with the webinar now. Uh, my name is Neil Paulimus. I'm the Chief Technical Officer here at StatPoint Technologies. I'm in charge of development of Stat Graphics. And what I thought I would do today is spend about 45 minutes um, showing you what we've added uh, to the recent uh, build of Stat Graphics Centurion version 16.2. Now, you'll see uh, with the go to webinar option here uh, that you can send questions. Uh, there should be a little dialog box there uh, on your screen. If you would, if any questions come up along the way, just uh, type them in and send them. And after I'm through with the presentation, we'll spend some time going over whatever questions uh, might arise. So the title of the webinar is What's New in Stack Graphics Centurion Version 16.2? Uh, we posted version 16.2 on the download page at stackgraphics.com I think a couple of weeks ago now. Um, and I'm going to be spending uh, some time here with you this morning uh, going over uh, what's new. Now, version 16.2 is a periodic maintenance release. Okay, it's not a major release of the program. You know, it's not a version 17 where, where we'll be adding lots and lots of new procedures. But it is a periodic maintenance release that we like to do oh, every once in a while uh, in order to put in and, and give you a couple different things. The first uh, thing that version 16.2 uh, contains is, is several new capabilities. Uh, there were several things that users had been asking for which we thought were important and also relatively easy uh, to build into the program uh, without going through uh, a major uh, version release. And I'll spend most of the time talking today about some of those new capabilities. Um, there are also improvements to specific procedures designed to fix known issues that have been reported to us, limitations, bugs, that sort of thing. Uh, every time we, we do a new build, we do try to uh, uh, fix anything that may have been reported to us. Now, version 16.2 is a free update for anyone who's using version 16. So if you have a license for version 16 of any sort using 16.0 or 16.1, you can go to our website, to the downloads page at stackgraphics.com, download the build that you'll see there in whatever language you have a license for. And basically, it installs on top uh, of what's already there. Uh, you should not have to reactivate it. Uh, it should just then pop up uh, with the new features I'll be talking about. Now, as far as the new capabilities of version 16.2, uh, we've added a number of, again, what we thought were important uh, features uh, that could be put in fairly easily. Um, the first thing I'll be talking about is the ability to add passwords to a stat folio. The stat folio is the main stat graphics document. It's like your project file that includes your analyses. Um, and what you can do now with version 16.2 is to protect those stat folios with passwords, meaning that once they're saved, uh, in order to reload it, you need to enter that particular password. We also have the ability to uh, keep an audit trail. Uh, every time the stat folio is saved, uh, it now puts a record uh, into the stat folio itself about when it was saved, what date and time it was saved on, and if you've entered a user's signature, it'll also keep a record of who it was that saved that stat folio uh, each time it was saved. Now, the first two uh, 
features here, new features, the passwords and the audit trail and the user, user signatures, well, that might be uh, three features. But these were all added uh, for folks that need to verify uh, the procedures that they're using, perhaps for, for the FDA or some other agency and demonstrate that they did not change the data, they did not change the stat folio uh, after it was uh, saved and verified and so forth. Um, so uh, it gives you the ability to print out uh, uh, a record demonstrating that in fact you had not made any changes uh, to the stat folio when you used it, uh, for example, on a, a modified set of data. Now, we've also added uh, several new summary statistics. Uh, there were several summary statistics that folks had added for that we put into the program. We also put in some new operators for character data. Uh, there were some operators um, that people saw in Excel that they thought would be useful to add to stat graphics. And I'll go over a couple of those. We modified the normal probability plot. Uh, in a couple ways. Uh, we added confidence limits for percentiles. Uh, we put the Shapiro-Wilk uh, test right on the normal probability plot. And I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Um, we also added new distributions in the statistical tolerance limits procedure. Now, statistical tolerance limits seem to be becoming, be becoming more and more important particularly for uh, people that need to demonstrate that they're meeting specification limits. And since everything in life is not, does not follow a normal distribution, uh, we thought it was important to give you as many options as possible uh, in those statistical tolerance limits. If you use our process capability procedures in our control charts, you know that there's actually a, a wide range of distributions that we offer as options in those procedures. So we scoured the literature to see what uh, we could also add, what results were available with respect to tolerance limits. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, we also um, added one other feature that applies to any graph, and that is that you can now use the wheel, if you have one on your mouse, to zoom in on a particular section of a graph. Okay, now, I'm going to demonstrate all that, but let's go on uh, first and talk about the passwords. Um, passwords allow you to protect a stat folio when you save it. Uh, if you have a stat folio, which again it is the main stat graphics document, and you've created a stat folio before you save it, you can go to the edit menu, uh, select stat folio password, which is a new option on the edit menu, and specify a password to be saved with that stat folio. Uh, you see the dialog box right here that will be to, uh, come up when you uh, select uh, that stat folio password from the edit menu. It asks that you enter a password twice. Um, it also allows you to enter a user signature. Now the user signature would typically be your name and as you'll see when I show you the audit trail when a stat folio is saved it saves a record of what the user signature was at that time. So if you get into the habit of always prompting uh, for a signature when you load a stat folio then you'll have a record of who changed that stat folio when they changed it um, every time you, uh, you reload it. Now, I, I'd like to actually go to stat graphics for a moment. Let me switch over to the stat graphics window here. Uh, this is the window for version 16.2. Uh, it won't look any different from 16.0 or 16.1, not the main window. Um, and uh, if you don't want to enter a password, when you save a stat folio, you don't have to. Well, let me show you the typical way of actually adding a password to a stat folio. I'm going to start by going to the File menu, go down to where it says Recent Data Files, and opening a, 
a very common data file that's used a lot in stack graphics, the 93 cars data file. Okay, this is the data file that has information on 93 different makes and models of, of automobiles. And I think I'll start by doing a regression. I'm going to go to relate, one factor, simple regression. Ask it to use miles per gallon in highway driving as the Y variable, horsepower as the X variable. Okay, this is just opening up a typical procedure. And I'll take all the defaults going in. I'll take a linear model. I'll be satisfied with whatever uh, tables and graphs it comes up with. Um, so far, no changes. Now, before I actually save this stat folio, I'm now, though, going to go to the Edit menu. And you'll see a new selection on the Edit menu called Statfolio Password. Now, what this will do is that will bring up that dialog box that I showed you before, um, asking what password would you like to add uh, to this statfolio. Now, um, in version 16.2, there's only a single password, an owner password. Okay? Um, when we come out with version 17, uh, there will be a more elaborate scheme for passwords. There'll be both owner passwords and user passwords. And you'll be able to actually, uh, if you are the owner, specify what a user uh, can change it and cannot change. Uh, in version 16.2, though, uh, there's just a single password. So I'll type in a password for this stat folio. I'll also put in my name here where it says user signature which you will see uh, appear when I show you the audit trail. And I'll also tell it that whenever it opens the stat folio, that it should always prompt for a signature, a user signature. Now, by the way, um, you can put in a user signature without putting in a password. Okay? If you would like it to keep track of who saved the stat folio and when, you can go ahead and fill in user signature, but leave the passwords blank, and it won't apply a password. Anyway, I'll push OK, and it tells me now that the new password will be applied the next time the stat folio is saved, Okay, which is fine by me, because I'm about to do that. I'm about to go to File, Save, uh, Save Stat Folio and uh, tell it that this is, oh, I think I'll call it password protected or something like that for the name of my stat folio and say save. Okay. It's now saved the stat folio with that password. Okay. So let's close it. Let's go to file and say new, which will get me back to an empty data sheet. Now I'll go to file. Let's pretend it's tomorrow to recent stat folios and ask to open the password protected stat folio. Well, before it will load that stat folio now, it's going to insist that I enter the password. Uh, now, I know what the password is. Um, I'm not going to tell you, not that it really matters for this particular example, but I'll enter the password that I had set a few moments ago. And where it says user signature, Oh, I think for the moment I'll type someone else because it could be someone else uh, opening up the stat folio. I'll then say OK, and what you'll see is you will see it open up the stat folio. Mm -hmm. Fairly simple scheme. There's a password associated with that stat folio, and if I don't open enter the right password, it's not going to open the stat folio. Okay. Now, back to my slides for a moment. Um, you see there uh, that when you do open a stat folio, if it contains a password, you need to open it. Uh, if there was no password, but you had told it that you wanted to prompt for the user's signature, uh, the password field would have been grayed out, uh, but it would have insisted that you put in some sort of user signature. Okay? So that if it got resaved, the stat folio, you'd know who it was who had opened it and resaved it. Okay. 
Now, a couple of cautions about statfolios with passwords. First off, passwords are completely optional. Unless you go to that edit menu to statfolio password, before you save the password, um, it will never prompt you when you open it. Uh, things will, by default, work the way they've always worked. But once you go to edit statfolio password, uh, then it's going to prompt you uh, before it resaves, uh, before it reloads the statfolio. Okay. Second thing you should know that if it is that if you forget the password for a saved statfolio, you're going to have to call us for information on how to load it. Okay. We're serious about protecting those statfolios. Uh, it's supposed to be a guarantee, you know, that you can show uh, to some third party to guarantee that you haven't changed things. So if you forget the password, there is a back door, there is a way to load that statfolio, but you're going to have to call us and ask us. And incidentally, it changes from day to day. Okay, so the the if you forget your password today, uh, we'll tell you how to open it, but that method's not going to work tomorrow. And you're going to have to call us again. So um, I do hope you don't forget the passwords uh, when you save the stat folios. A uh, third thing you should know is because of the addition of these passwords and user signatures and so forth, if you save a stat folio using version 16.2, you won't be able to open it with version 16.1 or version 16.0. Now, 16.2 can open older stat folios, but older versions can open new stat folios. That's the way it always tends to work as you know you move from one version to the next. The older programs, the older versions don't know anything about passwords, so they're not prepared to open those types of stat folios. So just beware uh, of that. Now, aligned with the uh, passwords is something called the audit trail. Uh, every stat folio, every version 16.2 stat folio uh, keeps an audit trail. An audit trail basically is a list, uh, a chronological list of when the stat folio was created, when it was saved, what the user signature was when it was saved, if it was reopened, what it had been modified, and so forth. So, for example, let me go back to Stack Graphics, and let's go to the File menu. And on the File menu, you will see an option called Display Audit Trail. Now, what this will do is bring up information that had been saved in the Statfolio I just loaded. Okay, and it tells me uh, when this particular Statfolio was created when it was opened, when various analyses were created, um, if any analyses had been modified, uh, when it was saved and what the user signature was when it was saved. It was saved by me. Um, and when it was reloaded, which was about a minute lo later, and whether any changes have been made either to the data or to the analyses since it was reloaded. Okay, This is the, the proof that you might want to print out. You can see there's a print button here on Display Audit Trail to demonstrate that neither the data nor the analyses have been changed um, since that stat folio was loaded. For example, let me go back here. Uh, press the right mouse button, go to analysis options, and perhaps ask for an exponential fit instead of a linear fit. If I now display the audit trail, you'll see that it will say modified analyses 
simple regression. And so it's now indicating that, oops, someone has gone in and modified the analysis. Okay, and if I resaved it now, okay, it would keep that record that in fact um, it had been uh, modified. Or if I was to go back and uh, change something in the data, maybe change one of the numbers in some column. Okay. If I then look at the audit trail, it'll also tell you, I think you can see it here, that data sheet A has been modified. So that you know after the data have been opened, after the statfolio was opened, that both the data and the analyses have been modified. Okay. Again, it's an audit trail. It's keeping track of what's been changed. And if I just resave it, let's just resave that statfolio. Do I want to save the data? No, I don't want to save the data. I'll just save the statfolio. You'll see if I look at the audit trail again that it was resaved by someone else. That was the signature I used when I reloaded the statfolio. And now we're back in a situation that the data is still modified. It's been modified since that file was open. But now, after this new statfolio has been saved, um, none of the analyses have been modified. So it's basically a chronological record of when it was opened, when analyses were changed, when they were modified, who saved the statfolio. This is something that we were asked for. Um, it was relatively easy to put in, but on the other hand, we also thought it, it was quite important to put in. Okay. Now, back to my slides for a moment. Um, um, again, it, it, the audit trail will keep track of that statfolio. Now, some of the other things we've added to version 16.2, uh, one of the things we've added is some new summary statistics. Um, summary statistics are statistics that typically appear if you go to something like the one variable analysis. Let me, for example, go to describe numeric data one variable analysis. Let's take miles per gallon in highway driving. And uh, you'll see that one of the default tables in the one variable analysis procedure is summary statistics. I'll press OK, and by default, uh, the summary statistics give you the count, the average, the standard deviation, min-max, a few things like that. If I press the right mouse button and go to pane options, there are four new statistics on this list. There is the harmonic mean. That's a new one. There's the Gini coefficient. There's the geometric standard deviation, and there's the mean absolute deviation. Those are four new statistics okay, that I can compute and add to this table of summary statistics. Now, what are those four new statistics? Well, the first one is the harmonic mean. Basically, the harmonic mean is the reciprocal of the average of the reciprocals of the data. Now, where it's typically used is if you want to average rates. If you have several different rates and you want to compute the average, the harmonic mean is a common statistic uh, used to average rates. Someone asked for it. I actually wondered why it took us 30 years to put that in the program, but we did uh, finally add the harmonic mean to the program. It's not used a lot, but um, there are uses for it. We also added something called the geometric standard deviation. The geometric standard deviation measures variation around the geometric mean. In this formula here, the X bar G stands for the geometric mean, and that's something that we've computed for a long time. Uh, what we have not computed up until version 16.2 is the geometric standard deviation. 
Now, where they come into play, at least at common use, is if you have data that follow a log normal distribution. Then the natural measures of central tendency and variation are the geometric mean and standard deviation. So we added that particular statistic. We added the mean absolute deviation, which is the average of the absolute values of the deviations of the observations around their uh, sample mean. Now, we had in previous versions the median absolute deviation, which was the median of these deviations here. But we did not have the mean absolute deviation. So what, you, uh, what you'll see in version 16.2 is an option to compute that statistic. Another statistic, and I must admit that this one was new to me until someone suggested it, is the Gini coefficient. At least that's how I'm pronouncing it. If I'm not pronouncing it right, I hope someone will, will let me know. Uh, it's a coefficient. I think it was developed in something like 1912, quite a while ago, which is useful and primarily used to measure inequality of income or wealth. Um, if you look at it, what it's basically looking at is all pairs of observations. It's looking, for example, at xi and xj summed over the entire data set. And it's adding up the absolute value of the differences between basically the ith observation and the jth observation. Scaled in such a way that if all the observations are the same, you know, let's assume that this is everyone's income. If everyone made the exact same amount of money, okay, then you'd get a zero. So zero basically implies perfect equality. Um, on the other hand, you see all the other constant terms and so forth. Uh, they're designed uh, such that if you have maximum inequality, which would be basically one person making all the money, okay, then you get a one, one representing maximum inequality. And on the scale zero to one, you could compare, for example, the inequality of income uh, amongst different countries or amongst different groups of people. I'm not sure exactly uh, what the person was doing who re requested this statistic. As I said, I hadn't heard about it, but it, it does seem to be uh, something that could be useful, so we added it to the program. We also added to the program some new operators to handle character data. Uh, there are a lot of operators in Stack Graphics to handle numeric data to do all sorts of things, logs and square roots and absolute values and so forth on numeric data, but it was pointed out to me that there were not many designed to handle character data. Um, so we took a look at Excel and took a look at some of the operators that were available for character data in Excel and we put them into Stack Graphics 16.2. Uh, there's a lower operator, which will take a character column like make, makes a column in my car data file with the make of the 93 different automobiles. Lower make would convert everything to lowercase. Upper converts everything to uppercase. Proper uh, capitalizes the first character of each word, but makes all the other characters lowercase. Trim, that's an interesting operator, that removes any leading or trailing blanks. We also added uh, four other operators for taking, well, related to the length of the string. LEN of make will count the number of characters in every cell. The left operator takes the leftmost, for example, 10 characters or rightmost 10 characters. And then we have a mid operator 
that will, for example, take 10 characters from every make starting at a particular position. Len, left, right, and mid. Now, let me show you where that would be used, by the way. Let's go back to stack graphics for a moment, back to the data file. Uh, this is the 93 cars data file. And let me go out till I find an empty column. Okay, here's one, column 27. Let me highlight that column for a moment, press the right mouse button, and let's say, tell it to generate data. Generate data is where you can enter a stack graphics expression involving these operators and have the results put into the column. So for example, I'll type lower make, make being the name of a particular column. Oh, and by the way, these are not case sensitive. I tend to type operators in uppercase, but you don't need to. But if you type lower make and press OK, you'll see, for example, that it put um, all of the makes uh, in lowercase. Or if I do it again, but this time I tell it uh, to do upper, U-P-P-E-R, uh, it'll make everything uppercase. Or if I go there, I won't do them all, I'll just do one more. Type L-E-N for length of make and press OK, it'll put the number of characters in each string. And they're all operating on this make column, by the way. Make is the first column back here in the file. So in this case, what it's done is showed me the number of characters in each. Okay. These can be useful operators, I'm sure, if you need to manipulate data once you have it into stack graphics to do make different types of labels do different types of operations. So they've been added to version 16.2. Okay. What else have we added to version 16.2? Well, let's see. Let me go back to my slides for a moment. By the way, um, after the webinar is done, if you go to stackgraphics.com to the webinars page, you can download my slides. Okay, it's just a PowerPoint presentation, so you can download the slides and go back through them. Uh, I tried to make it um, a fairly concise uh, explanation, uh, I hope, uh, of what we put into the program. Now, one of the other statistical procedures that we modified, uh, added some options to, basically, are the normal probability plots. Normal probability plots are plots that are commonly used to help determine whether or not data are well represented by a normal distribution. Now, uh, there were several suggestions that were made um, about how we could enhance that normal probability plot. Uh, so we've basically done three things. First, we now allow you to add crosshairs to a normal probability plot for a selected percentile. For example, if you were interested in the 90th percentile, um, uh, you can add crosshairs to the plot, as you'll see, that identify where the 90th percentile is. You can put confidence limits uh, on the plot, bounds around the points, um, demonstrating uh, the uncertainty in all of the percentiles, at least assuming a norm, that they do follow a normal distribution. And then finally, you can also add the results of the Shapiro-Wilk test, which is the most common test of normality, statistical test, and put the results right on the normal probability plot. Now let me show you how we do that. And to do that, let me close off everything I've done so far. I won't bother saving anything. This time, though, I'll open up another data file. This one's called Bottles. Bottles is a data file. These, all these data files, incidentally, are shipped with stack graphics. There are sample data files, so you can try it out yourself. Uh, the Bottles file, though, contains 100 observations on the breaking strength of glass bottles. 
basically it was a production facility where every 10 minutes they took one bottle and measured its breaking strength. Okay. To create a normal probability plot, there are actually several places you can do it. But I normally go to plot, exploratory plots, normal probability plot. I'll go ahead and put in strength and press OK, take all the defaults, and you'll see the default normal probability plot. Okay. Now you'll already, if you use this normal probability plot, see one enhancement, and that is we put some statistics uh, for the data in the margin of the plot. In this case, it's giving the sample size the median, the standard deviation, the Shapiro-Wilkes W statistic, and a p-value for the Shapiro-Wilkes test. Okay. Now, um, if I push the right mouse button and go to pane options, you will see a number of different options. At the moment, it's fitting the line using quartiles. Now it's using a method that was actually suggested by John Tukey many years ago where it takes the median and the quartiles and basically draws a line um, indirectly estimating the mean and standard deviation based upon the median and the quartiles. Uh, there's another way of doing it and that is fitting least squares to the data. Now it turns out that if you use the method of least squares, then you can put bounds around the line that give you some confidence level for the percentiles. I'll show you this in, in just a moment. You can also ask now for crosshairs at a particular percentile. So I'm going to switch it to using least squares. I'm going to ask it to include the 90th percentile. I don't need that. Um, I'm going to ask for two-sided confidence limits and also for the Shapiro-Wilk test. Okay. What this is going to do is this is going to add a considerable amount of information. Now, since it's now fit the line by least squares in the right-hand margin, it's giving me the sample size, the sample mean, and the sample standard deviation. Rather than the median, it's, it's back to the mean because it's done the least squares fit. Uh, the way you interpret the Shapiro-Wilkes W statistic is that basically if you have a p-value bigger than 0.05, then you would not reject the normal distribution as a reasonable model for the data at the 5% significance level. So I can see, just looking at the plot here, that according to the Shapiro-Wilkes test, the p-value is well above 0.05, so it appears that the normal distribution is quite adequate for this data. The bounds around the line are 95% limits. You can see that at the top of the plot. They are 95% limits for all of the percentiles uh, for this particular distribution, this strength distribution. It's actually also drawn the crosshairs at one particular percentile. I told it to draw crosshairs at the 90th percentile. So if you look across at 90 and down, it says that the 90th percentile is 268.607. With 95% confidence, I believe that the 90th percentile is somewhere between 265.747 and 271.493. So you get, with the crosshairs, a single percentile, both the estimate of the best estimate of the percentile and a 95% confidence interval for that estimate. And it's also drawn as bounds around the line 
the 95% confidence intervals for all percentiles. Not only the 90th percentile, but down here, the distance between the bounds would be the 95% confidence limits for the fifth percentile. Um, nice enhancement, I think. I guess I'm a little uh, biased, but I think it's quite a nice enhancement uh, to the normal probability plot. Okay, so that's one of the statistical procedures that we actually added some features to. And back in my slides, you'll see the modified normal probability plot. The other statistical procedure that we added uh, capability to is that of statistical tolerance limits. Now, I remember when I took my statistics course uh, in college as an undergraduate, that would be back in about 1970, uh, Stu Hunter was my professor in that class. And, and when he first introduced the topic of statistical tolerance limits, he told us how important it was uh, to be able to compute tolerance limits. Um, for many years, though, it, it's been a neglected sort of a topic until recently. Uh, now, when I go and, and teach courses on stat graphics at many companies, uh, they're using now the statistical tolerance limits as a means for demonstrating that their data meet uh, the desired specifications uh, for that particular variable. Um, people doing process capability analysis, um, where they always used to compute only things like CPK, uh, are now computing uh, tolerance limits uh, as an alternative to that. What tolerance limits do, incidentally, is they are used to bound a specified percentage of a population with a given level of confidence. I can ask, for example, where does 99% of my population, where is it likely to lie, give me an interval that I'm 95% certain will contain 99% of my population. That's a statistical tolerance limit. And actually, there are both two-sided limits and one-sided bounds. I could also say, give me a number such that I'm 95% certain 99% of my population is bigger than that number or less than that number, depending upon what you pick. Now, in version 16.1, you could compute a tolerance limit, assuming your data came from a normal distribution, or a log normal distribution, or a liable distribution. Uh, the options on the left-hand side of the dialog, down through non-parametric, were the only choices you had in version 16.1. In version 16.2, you can compute tolerance limits assuming your data come from a Cauchy distribution or an exponential distribution or a gamma distribution. We also have Laplace, largest extreme value, Pareto, and smallest extreme value. Now, to show you how this is useful, let me go back to stack graphics again. Let me close off this uh, particular data set. And this time, open up a data file called resistivity. Now, resistivity is a data file with 100 observations on the measured resistivity of electronic components. Now, this is a, a, a set of data, 100 observations in that resistivity column that I often use to demonstrate data that don't come from a normal distribution. For example, let me go to the Describe menu to Distribution Fitting. Let's go, let me go down to fitting uncensored data, which is where I would normally go to identify the distribution for a particular uh, set of data. I'll tell it I want to analyze resistivity. By default, it will, uh, it will go ahead and fit a normal distribution, which is always a good thing to start with. Okay, it's going to ask for well, offer me various tables and graphs. 
I think I'll ask for an analysis summary for tests for normality and also a comparison of alternative distributions. Okay. Well, here, here's the, the data. There are 100 observations ranging from 117.5 to 509.6. It started by fitting a normal distribution. Well, that's actually not a very good fit. That, act, that data, that normal curve there, has the same mean and standard deviation as the data, but it doesn't have the same shape. The data are actually quite skewed. You see that the data come fairly quickly if you go from 100 up to about 200 to a high peak, but have quite a long tail. If you go look at the Shapiro-Wilkes test, here's the Shapiro-Wilkes test back here. The p-value is 0 0.000005, fairly dramatic rejection uh, of the normal distribution, well below 0.05. The table that gives you a comparison of alternative distributions, I hope you've seen this before, what this does is fit actually a whole wide range of distributions sorts them from best to worst. And in fact, a much better distribution for this data set is the largest extreme value distribution. If you'd like to see it, let me go back here to the histogram, press the right mouse button, go to analysis options, and instead of doing the normal, do the largest extreme value. And now you see that the largest extreme value distribution has the same shape as the data, much better uh, match to the data set. Okay, well, that's just fitting the distribution. That's not the tolerance limits. If I want the statistical tolerance limits, I need to go to describe, numeric data, statistical tolerance limits from observations. I'll put in my data, which is resistivity. If I had a spec, I could also uh, have it draw on the graph my specification limits. I won't worry about that right now. What I, I will do, though, is I, I will switch from the default normal distribution over to the largest extreme value distribution. I'll ask for two-sided limits a level of confidence of 95%, a population proportion of 99%. Take the defaults, and you will see the output that you get. Okay, what it's done is it showed you, again, the fitted largest extreme value distribution. The largest extreme value distribution, incidentally, has two parameters, the mode, which is the peak, which is at 203.355, and a scale parameter, which is similar to something like a standard deviation, but measures spread. Over here, it's telling me that my 95-99% limits go from 94.36 to 492.62. So I'm 95% confident that at least 99% of all electronic components will have resistivities between 94.36 and 492.62. Okay, in 16.1, you could not do it for the largest extreme value distribution. You can in version 16.2. Okay. All right. Now, uh, one more feature that we've added to Stack Graphics, and that is the ability to use the mouse wheel, the wheel on your mouse, to expand the graph. Uh, notice, let's go back to Stack Graphics for a moment. Here's my plot. If I take my mouse, position the cursor someplace on the graph, and move my mouse wheel, you will see that moving the mouse wheel expands and contracts the graph. And it does it around the position of the cursor. So if I move the cursor down here and do an expansion, maybe right down here, actually, this might be even better, uh, it'll expand around wherever I have the mouse wheel. Okay. 
um, it was pointed out to me that we were not using the mouse wheel and that it would be a nice feature to be able to zoom a graph. There are other ways to zoom it, but the mouse wheel uh, is a nice handy way to do it. Okay. Anyway, that was the last feature that we added to version 16.2. As I said at the beginning, uh, we also did uh, fix uh, certain problems and limitations uh, that have been reported to us. Uh, I have made a table here of the most important fixes that we made in version 16.2. Um, we can now import strings with more than 70 characters. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but the limit the longest string that stack you can enter in the stack graphics data sheet is one with 70 characters. Um, we had problems uh, importing, uh, for example, Excel files if the strings were uh, longer than 70. Uh, that's been taken care of. Uh, there was a, a change to cluster analysis, so you can run it uh, now the first time to cluster variables rather than observations. Uh, tabulation will now handle data with more than 40 characters. That had been the limit in the tabulation. Uh, we made a couple changes to the principal components procedure. Um, uh, it now saves all of the component weights if you ask to save the weights back to the data sheet, um, even if the number of observations is less than the number of variables. Um, the standard and principal components can be saved, uh, uh, principal coordinates can be saved to the data sheet. Uh, XML scripts uh, now respect the legend position and size. They were actually ignoring any tags that specified where the legend block should be located. Um, Taguchi designs uh, created in version 15 can now be analyzed. There were certain Taguchi designs that had been created in earlier versions of stack graphics uh, that were not being analyzed, uh, refused to analyze them. Um, interactive applets uh, now display in browsers if you do a stat publish. I don't know if you've ever used the interactive applets, but you can when you publish your results to a web page, to an HTML page, if you select Java applets, you can then click on points on the web page and it will show you the coordinates. Well, there was a problem in certain browsers, which we fixed. Um, the general linear models procedure, uh, the exclude button uh, now works on the plot of the fitted model. And in uh, multiple correspondence analysis, you can specify supplementary points now on the first dialog box where you could not do that before. Uh, so we made a, a couple, uh, as I said, uh, improvements and fixes uh, so that things would behave uh, the way we wanted them to behave. All right. Well, that is um, what I wanted to talk about uh, today, uh, give you an introduction to what we've added into version 16.2. Uh, I'm now going to take a look and see if there have been any questions. Okay. Well. Um, I'm getting a message that there were quite a few questions, but they have already been answered. I guess they were fairly specific. If anybody wants to send a, a question in right now, I'll wait here for a couple minutes. Um, this is not a topic that probably generates a, a lot of uh, questions. Otherwise, uh, certainly go ahead and send us via email uh, any questions you'd like. And uh, hopefully you've all tried version 16.2. Um, as I said, it's not a major release. It's, it's a periodic maintenance release. But we did take the opportunity to put in uh, a number of procedures that we thought would, would be helpful. And we did not want to wait uh, for version 17. Okay, well this is, um, I don't see any questions, so I'm going to end now. This is the first webinar of the fall. Um, we took a, a somewhat of a hiatus because we've been very uh, active uh, doing development. 
uh, but we will now um, try to start up these webinars again. So uh, keep an eye on our website on stackgraphics.com uh, and we'll announce uh, a couple weeks ahead of time in any additional uh, webinars. And I'll try to get back into the habit of doing one a month if I can. Okay, thanks for your attention. Uh, that will end the webinar. Bye-bye.